Hello, welcome to Quok Talk. I'm Crystal here on Think Tech Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock. So, you know, last week this whole Trump stuff going on, I am devastated. I don't know about you guys out there, but, uh, you know, hands on. I support you who support him. That's fine. But my concern as a woman and uh, as a talk show host for women's issues is where's our voice going to be? I think it's even more important to give more voice to very important issues because it's probably going to be pushed under the rug as usual for people who don't even see harassment as an issue, right? So on that note, we're going to talk about something pretty serious today. Sex trafficking. Now, this is something, again, is a huge international topic that is pushed under the rug. Why? I don't know. We'll discuss it today. But more importantly, we're going to hone in on Hawaii and particularly focus on the underage girls who are being sex trafficked here in Hawaii, something that people don't even realize exists or maybe don't care to discuss because it's such an ugly truth. So we're going to welcome our two guests today to talk about this very, very serious topic of sex trafficking, welcoming uh, Tammy, Tammy Bentanga, and uh, Nicole Brody. Now, Tammy, well, both of you are all both from Ho'ola, Napua, and you've been on before. But today we're going to talk about you as women, you as a uh, trafficked victim before, um, and Nicole as the new operations manager. So, welcome ladies, first of all. Great Thank you for you. having us. Thank you. Now, Tammy, I understand you just came back from Washington for some uh, very important conference on juvenile uh, trafficking. Can yeah, so it was, a, it was a conference that um, kind of went across the United States. We had over 100 survivors there. So, although I was a victim of sex trafficking, I consider myself a survivor right. and victorious over everything that was trying to take away from me, right? right. So, today I'm a survivor, but um, I also get out there and empower other girls that have been trafficked. Um, so that was the purpose of going to the conference, was to um, find out what they're doing nationwide. And there were some uh, providers from Canada, too. Okay. So that was really interesting, how Canada is handling the issue of juvenile sex trafficking. What was your big takeaway from it? Or was there something that quite alarming that, that just woke you up to even new, newer truths? Well, the confirmation that I got there was that we need to collaborate, we need to partner, and we need to be providing services, and it needs to be a multidisciplinary action. It can't just be service providers doing one thing and law enforcement doing one right. thing and the community doing one thing. We all have to work together. Yeah. And so that is what's going to be my... Um, my mission is to get that partnering and collaboration going right. in Hawaii. Yes, um, specifically. And as far as what are we doing at DC and what on that level, yeah. um, I have a very good survivor friend that is right in the White House. Oh, good. She got a job and she is going to make, um, She's gonna make some minor, noise. minor domestic sex trafficking is going to be on the forefront and we are going to get um, kids that have been commercially sex trafficked, right. the services they need and the recognition and the prevention piece is going to be um, much better than it's ever been. So glad in to America. hear that. Excellent. Yeah. Great, great. And in Hawaii because well, I got her up there now. I'm that's like, what oh, I'm going to put in. <laughs> on your um, newsletter or your information on the organization, apparently Hawaiian sex trafficking was only banned recently. What is that all about? Uh, yeah, Hawaii last Hawaii? year um, we passed the law that. Um, acknowledges that sex trafficking um, creates victims as opposed to perpetrators. So before, um, even underage victims of sex trafficking were treated as criminals and um, were treated as prostitutes and in a criminal way, and so now they're treated as victims. And what does that mean for these young adults? Um, it means that they won't be incarcerated as they had previously been, that there are opportunities for treatment um, and that there is more help. And it's really um, the symbolism is also very important, that law enforcement and people throughout the criminal justice system acknowledge that these are, in fact, victims as opposed to perpetrators of a crime. And I think that that mentality shift is very important. And Hawaii was actually the last state in the entire country to pass this law. So that's a little bit of an embarrassment, yeah. but a victory that we are finally there. Right, better late than never. Yes. How do you both feel as women about this whole kind of victim-perpetrator uh, controversy? Because in a lot of cases, particularly in college rape cases, there's always that ongoing argument of how much she put herself in this situation to allow this to happen. You know, all that bullshit. It has so to what be, do you feel? For me, it has to be a zero tolerance. A 13-year-old cannot say that I dreamed to be a prostitute and I am going to go be a prostitute. A 12-year-old does not do that. 
A 16-year-old does not do that, and a 17-year-old, in my opinion, does not do that. But they can be coerced, and that is what sex trafficking, the, the definition of sex trafficking is, is force, fraud, or coercion. So if you put a girl that's on the run, mm. say, doesn't have food, and you put it in front of her that you can make money, right. and so here, let's, let's go do this, and then the guy is making money off of her, he might feed her, but still, that was a, 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 a sort of coercion that mm. brought her there, mm. yeah? So even, um, you know, traffickers, they have a lot of ways to bring um, kids into... Of course, into, they're preying on their it. vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are Absolutely. there statistics, I mean, I hate to use numbers, but just to kind of get in the, in the scope of uh, Hawaii and, and the amount of girls who are out there susceptible to these, these dangers, is there like the... Um, yeah, well, I mean, once girls run away from home, that, um, that goes back to what Tammy was just talking about, which is called survivor sex, like the ability to, to feed yourself. Right. You will trade um, your body for food, for drugs, for a place to stay, I mean, whatever it is. Um, and so when girls, um, and, and boys actually, if they run away from home, there's a very high risk that within 48 hours, um, I believe is, is it 80%? Um, within 48 hours, or, um, yeah, they've been approached. So about one third, actually, one third of girls who have been who run away within yeah. um, 48 hours have been approached for sex. Is it because these young girls, you know, stand out? You know, well, what's a 13-year-old doing um, at two in the morning in Waikiki, right? I mean, yeah, that's and just... I mean, unfortunately, I, there's really something that you know, what's the type of mentality where people see a girl who is alone and needing help, and then they decide to prey on her. And they say, oh, you know, I can use this for my benefit. And I think that that's really something that we have to examine as a community and as a culture of when and why and how is that ever okay. Um, has Hawaii been able to kind of tackle the types of people who are trafficking these girls? Are, are there sources? Well, it doesn't look like what we always think it looks like. Mm -hmm. So what we typically think a pimp and yeah. his prostituted girl work, look like right. is not what trafficking looks like in Hawaii all the time. Okay. They, you do have that scenario. Right. You can go down to Kuhio, you can go down back Hotel, Hotel Street and you can see it. Yeah. But typically it, it's not always going to look like that. There's back page, there's massage parlors, there's familia, there's all kinds of different ways. There's the drug addicted uncle that's prostituting his right. niece for drugs. Um, there's the family that's prostituting their child because they need a place to stay and he, she goes and has relations with the landlord. I mean, there's so many different scenarios and that's where Holonapua comes out and says, you know what, people, we need to look at the whole picture and we need to look at how kids are being trafficked. Mm. And so that's where our educational piece comes in and right. we go out in the schools and in community and bring awareness to the fact that, you know, this is what it looks like. Yeah. This is a real case. This is really what it looked like. And so that people can see, oh my, that, you know, I just saw that red flag okay. and I, I can report it now. Right. And then where do you report it? Yeah. So Holonapua is really on the ground making sure that as a community, we know what we're doing. Yeah, the awareness and communication. Are there, I mean, I hate to kind of pinpoint it into or, or stereotype a certain type of girl who would be more susceptible to it, but are there some background, you know, like you said, the uncle who, who pimps that, the stepdaughter to a friend. I mean, there are certain scenarios which, or situations that kind of give them that danger. Well, to go back to the runaway statistic, 80% yeah. of runaways um, have experienced some sort of abuse at the home. So domestic abuse. violence already in the household. Yeah, and so I think kids who have been victimized in their home uh -huh. are more susceptible, but we've found that that's not always the case. And like, it's not universal. Right, of course. But assuming that is like a majority of the cases, these type of girls who go off on their own, what do you think their mentality is at the time? Is it a defiance to, to, to stray particularly away from their screwed up family? Or is there something in their life that they think they're empowering, that they're on their own, and they're going to make decisions for themselves, mistakenly? Okay, so I can speak on this from personal experience, and that's why I'll bring Please. my story in. Okay. So um, I was sexually abused in the home um, by a family member from 4 to 13. Oh, jeez. So during that time, it was forced on me, and I had no choice whatsoever, right? Because right? I was in the care of the family member. 
So as I got placed into foster care, CPS took me. I became um, a ward of the state. My family totally gave me up. And, and so I was now, um, you know, in foster care. Right. Okay. So my normal family, I, I come from a pretty well-to-do family. Huh. And so, you know, my dad always drove a Cadillac or a Thunderbird or a Continental. And, you know, he was an insurance salesman. And, you know, we always had money. We always had. Right. Okay. Right. So then when I get put in the foster care system, um, I'm in a foster home with five other girls. Um, the lady was super good to us. She taught us a lot of good things, did a lot of good things, but, but was never really able to fill that void for one the physical intimacy that I had with the family member was null right so if you grow up from 4 to 12 psychologically 13 psychologically you have that um, your body is kind of addicted to that sexual arousal really okay? so this wow. is like that's I'm totally that, not a therapist yeah. but whatever but I'm just gonna tell you, you what it is yeah and so and so then I start looking for boyfriends ah. right so I have boyfriends I have plenty of boyfriends from the time I'm 13 till the time I'm 15 so you got a distorted view of yeah your, absolutely of, okay. of love of what is that what look like right, right? Okay. and so I you know I have plenty of boyfriends till I'm 15 a girl comes into the foster home who is um, being prostituted in Waikiki, they pick her up as a runaway. She huh. comes into our foster home. She tells us all the glory, the glamour, blah blah. And I'm over here giving it away for free. But now she's telling me how much money you can make by, you know, having a man and being able to get paid. So and she's so, happy doing this. So it's totally glamorized, is. right? And this is in the '70s, okay? So I'm kind of aging myself, but whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> whatever. So, <laughs> and so, you know, I with my girlfriends, we go to Waikiki. Yeah. We meet up with some guys. They got weed. They got drugs. They got right, right. They got if it's everything. Cool, Thing. It's like they got an apartment. So that night, I didn't go home to my foster home. I went home with the dude. And How come, old were you then? I was 15. Okay. And so he was like 33 or so. And so... Local? No. Totally not from here. Okay. <laughs> and totally did not look like he was from here. He was a... He was... Um, I don't even want to say. But, but maybe anyway. that was why he was but he, attractive. But though. he was quite studly. He was very, very good looking. <laughs> very, very good looking. Had it together apartment in Waikiki was living the life so I you know I went home sure. with him I got I got hooked in you yeah. know and I was vulnerable yes you know I wasn't even a runaway at that time I had a place to live right but I was lacking this this thing and so part of that is that the sex abuse that happened did not get addressed I had no therapy no there was no addressing all they did okay now we're in the 70s right so they didn't know better they just remove the child that's being abused from the home, put them in a safe place, life goes on. There's no supervision or? There was no therapy. I had a social worker, but nobody was addressing the damage the sex abuse did from four to 13. Right. So I'm still damaged goods, right, out there trying to live my life. So I was in, it was the summer after ninth grade, and I, I, thought, okay, I chose to be with this guy, and now I got to do whatever he tells me to do. What did you think, though, going into his life? So you thought he was going to take care of you? I just knew. I mean, I already you knew. Know? At 15, I'd already been giving it away. I, no, I was a but did you, did you think he was going to control your life? Oh, or did you absolutely. Think he was just gonna, oh, I was so ready. So was okay. I was fine. I was ready to just say, yeah, take I'm going to be your main lady. Okay. So that was my mentality. But what my point is, is that because I didn't have the sex abuse addressed, now I had control. I'm your main lady. I'm going to make your big money. I'm going to do what you want me to do. That was my mentality. And let me tell you, I did it to the fullest. I, I actually um, worked in a massage parlor in Alaska. And so he pimped you to money. all the other places. So I, um, so I worked in Waikiki for a little bit. Yeah. I street walked in Waikiki, right. and then I went to Alaska, and I worked inside, and then I worked outside. Um, okay. And, and I'm not glamorizing that life at all, but I'm just trying to make a point of what my mentality was like and why at that girls time. Do that. Yeah, and, and let me go a little bit further because I got away really quick. I, only, I was only with him for six months. I did not... Um, I, I ran away from him because he was in Alaska and I came back to Hawaii. Um, he was wanted here for uh, uh -huh. attempted murder. Wow. So I came cool. back to Hawaii knowing he would never come to Hawaii. So I wasn't afraid that he would come back. Okay. And I cruised Waikiki and I did everything and I kept on pulling that little card out of my pocket whenever I needed it. And I did it for 20 years. Wow. Yeah. Okay, wait. This is loaded. 
Tammy, do you Bye. mind if we take a quick break with you? <laughs> this is like, my God, I can't believe I'm talking to someone who's experienced this, and people think you see it just in movies. But listen, people out there, there is sex trafficking. That Tammy's talking about, she's, she's making a life story of something that's just so damaging and destructive. We need to come back to this. Let's take a little break. If you have a glass of wine, go, sip it. We'll come back and continue with Tammy's story and hopefully bring truth and, and reasons and, and understanding to all this. Okay. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Join me every other Monday when we bring lawyers who know how to get across the sea to meet people and resolve problems into your house. Thank you. Aloha, I'm Chantel Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. This show is for you. It's all about inspiring and empowering girls of the future to do what they love, get out there and be healthy, fit and confident. If you're up for that, 11 a.m. every Wednesday. I'll see you there. Who else talked to you about this? <laughs> Back on sex trafficking with Tammy Batanga and Nicole Brody. Um, you know, heavy stuff. I mean, girls, but everyone out there, you have women in your lives. And if somebody is in danger of being affected by someone who's just, forget it. Oh, God. Oh, let's just talk. Let's, Tammy, just complete your story in a, I'm sh sorry about this time frame but you said that you got in you got hooked into this world and then you got pimped all over in Alaska and here and then you came back and yeah. then so I came back to Hawaii I stayed on the run for another six months or so and were then you I, making a lot of money uh yeah but that's kind of beside the point <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm Asian to glamorize it. I'm Asian and so <laughs> me? I'm Asian and I'm young so that's what a lot of uh, buyers like okay. Asian and young so anyway, that was the, that was the 70s. So, I still and like then I, I still, you know, I came back to Hawaii. I, got, I went back to school. I, I went back to high school. All Good. the while, trafficking wow. was never a word. I prostituted myself. I was a prostitute. Did you tell your friends? I was pimped. Um, yeah, some of them, okay. you know, some of them knew kind of what I was doing. Um, and then I, I went back to high school. I normalized, Great. Um, but I did a lot of drugs. I smoked a lot of weed. I did. Does a lot that always of coke. go hand in hand, based on sometimes? Weed? And what it, what what I know today, what I was doing was just numbing myself. Yeah. So self-medicating. Yeah. Yes, so I just to. Okay. I got into like a, a like a psychologist would come. By then, they figured I needed some help, so they would send a child psychologist to my foster home. Uh -huh. um, so I had that for like a year, but it, it wasn't that effective. Right. Um, and then I got pregnant my senior year of high school, went into a very violent relationship with my son's dad, got out of that, went into um, a, a domestic violence shelter. Um, from there, I had another boyfriend, which was violent, and then another boyfriend, which was violent. So by the time I was 30 years old, I had three TROs against three different men. And it was just, I, I was like a caged animal. And so if you ever, like, I finally had to take responsibility for my part in those TROs because if you're ever in if you're ever um, a victim of any kind of violence you just you just act out in every way mm. you know you just Manifest act out you just act out okay so by the time I was like 34 it, I was just in this whirlwind of crazy and my girlfriend said you know what Tom you're going to kill yourself if you don't stop this now all the while from, I started working in a law office when I was 22 years old so I worked in law offices and um, but I would still go in the drinky bars and work. Huh. I'd go in the strip bar and work. Because that was just part of your habits. Yeah. So and so you know, I'd, we'd go to the club. I'd pick up a date in Waikiki. I, I, it was just a double life that I huh. lived. I was raising my son. Wow. Um, so by the time my son was 16, you know, we had been through a lot. He had seen a lot in his life. You know, he was kind of damaged. He had to get counseling. Did he know what was going on with you? Totally mm. knew, but it was really? very. Um, you know, I don't know. It was just. And the did you way ever have a conversation life. with we've him? We've had many conversations. He's 33 today, and, and we've had many conversations. And I, there's a lot of guilt that went along with the lifestyle that I lived. Mm. But um, but at, at about 34 years old, my girlfriend said, "You got to change. You got to stop." So I did. I, I went to church with her, and I started um, figuring out that I needed healing, that I needed to um, stop that life. 
and so for about 10 years, I, um, I went through a, a lot of inner healing and a lot of um, just, just abuse um, recognition, like who's the abuser, me mm -hmm. or them, and um, uh, t you know, stop the substance, the drinking, the alcohol, like all of that. Like, why did it take so long? I'm sorry to, to it, it, it make that It took so sound. long. No, you are hitting it on okay. the nail. That is exactly what we want to talk about okay. is because we never addressed the sex trafficking. We never addressed the abuse. And the trauma. So, right. And the self-blame. Right. That kind of... So, I go to church and I go to this woman's conference and then people are talking about it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're talking about it. What is that sex trafficking? And so I go and then I realize, I got to really compact this. I realize that I was a victim of sex trafficking. I realized that when I was probably about 45. That's crazy. Right? All that time, 30 years, I thought I made a bad choice, right? And so, even then, I would talk to them, my whole and Apua sisters and survivor sisters, and I would say, oh my gosh, he, he wasn't even that bad, you know? Like, he never abused me. Was this psychologically trying to make yourself feel better? No, that that's normal? what I believed. That, really? I believed that it wasn't that bad, and he never hurt me, and he never abused me. I'm talking about defense mechanisms, right? Yeah, yeah so I was In order say, to survive, you convince yourself of certain things, and I think... Could you, you know, see through that? When she's telling you these stories? Um, oh, I didn't know her okay. then, and I don't know that I... Yeah, and I don't think you can necessarily see through that. I think you understand that... And it's no, hard to the response would be, Tammy, he sold you. Tammy, you he, need put to your be life in that. he put your life in danger. Yeah. That, that's what kind of the light bulb finally went on. And then, and then they were talking about sex trafficking, and then I was like, oh my gosh, I was a victim that. of that. And so, yeah, it's like, boom, light bulb. And then it was like, I cannot sit here any longer with my mask on and say, I have a normal life. My and life so that is goes totally back abnormal. Back to like, Ho'olan Apua, yeah. what we're trying to do is identify these girls um, immediately, understanding the trauma that they've been through, the trauma of trafficking, perhaps trauma that happened before that, and treating it at its core, like what yep. Tammy was saying, because the initial abuse was never treated, it just led and manifested to all of these other things, just decades of self-harm and potentially harm to others as well. Absolutely. And so um, it's really identifying it right then and there and getting them the treatment that they need to deal with all of that trauma. And so that's what our, our home is, a therapeutic residential facility that will be dealing with those therapeutic needs that are very unique to this community. Right. Well, the healing aspect, I can imagine, is just, you know, a lifelong process. Yeah. But, you know, the, the girls who were lucky enough to be identified at an early time, it, you know, you, you've got something going on there. What about, like Tammy, you know, you, you let it slip by. You went through continual struggles and complications because you didn't even address or think that you were a victim. So what about these women who were trafficked like 10, 20 years ago? Are they emerging and realizing after your awareness programs and education networks that they are indeed part of this and coming out to voice it? Or is is yes. there some kind of a rise in that? Yes, absolutely. Go so ahead. I have about three other survivors in Hawaii that are over 40 years old that we um, have been trying to come together and just address the issues that we deal with today. Um, and so that's, you know, that's that's another story. But, but, what what we really um the the real issue here is that we need a place for these kids to go because that's what's happening is we're identifying them today and Good. we are we identify not only that they are actually have actually been trafficked even if they've been trafficked for one day if you can imagine somebody who's been raped one time the trauma that they deal with one time right. okay so if you have a girl that's been on the street say for instance Maybe she's been on the street for a week, yeah? Maybe she's being trafficked for a week. Potentially, if she's had five dates a day, how many times has she been raped? Right. So we call that complex PTSD okay. because her trauma is deeper than that one time. And so that's the issue that we have today is that these kids deal with so much trauma. And the way that we compare that is if somebody's been to war yeah. and somebody's been trafficked, 
And if you do that brain scan thingy that they do, I don't know what it's that, called because oh, I'm not a medical yeah. person, but right. whatever you call okay. it, um, the firing, the lighting up of the brain is the same because the trauma is similar. So if we can teach them, and, and you know, the self-hatred and all the guilt, yes. and, and, and a lot of times we, like I, I was down for my man. I was not going to turn him in. I, I, I ran Did away from him. Did you have feelings for him? I is that totally why? had feelings for him. And, and the thing that's is, that's the problem, that's right? Part of, that's the, their technique. Is yeah. What they do is get girls to fall in love with them. Yeah. And they're much more easy to manipulate that one. So, so when you pull these girls off, do they admit that they're a victim? Or does it take time for them to oh, release we, all the... We have to be very... It takes time. Yeah, and we I'm have sure. to be very, um, you know... Um, innovative about the way that we approach sure. that because they do not if, if they're okay think of it if you're in a foster home say it for me okay. i was in a foster home and then i had all this freedom and i had all this drugs and I had all this boyfriend and it was like my life was totally good and then and then i had to go back into foster care and then i had to go back to school and then i had to go you know like you get all your freedoms taken away from you like really like how much better are we doing this? Because how come at, the foster homes had no more supervision in terms of how you live, lived your lives outside of school. I mean, it wasn't little, the foster care system. It's not their responsibility no, to care what you're doing at midnight as a well, 13 year old. Well, by the time it was midnight, I was on the run, so I was reported. Oh boy. Okay. So in our short time left, unfortunately, you're gonna have to come back and talk about more cases. <laughs> but for this short minute left, what do you both ladies have to say? Uh, on this issue or how can we all support and help and move this all forward to create awareness oh man i mean for me <laughs> um one thing that i i hate the word slut i would love if we could just eradicate I that know. from our language entirely completely yeah. forever for everybody um i think that making women feel bad about having sex having whatever whatever their situation is i just think that that needs to stop um in all of its forms and i think that part of the tools that um, people who are trafficking girls use is that blackmail of I will tell everyone what you've done you are worthless because you are like this um, and that a lot of the trauma could be undone if we would just stop using that word and stop slut shaming yeah. right okay slut shaming right yeah good one yep yeah okay. um, I think just making sure that as we identify these um, girls is that they um, know where to go for help. So Hole in a Pool has a uh, mentorship program so that because we don't have our home open yet, but we do, we are able to reach the girls that we do identify today. Well, we so have the website we help, just put help. up. So We're here to help. Uh, please, uh, everyone, you know, this is a community thing. This is a world international issue. Hope you all can uh, embrace this issue. Heartfelt from both of you. Thank you so much for being here. And Thank you. remember, talk to the people in your family, educate and respect, especially with boys. I think that it starts from there, too. Um, thank you for tuning in, and I hope that you take this very serious topic to mind and be a little more concerned for that community and support it. Thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you for on. having thank us. Bye-bye.